start the recording. Okay, so hello and welcome everyone. My name is Mary Chandler Beam. I'm a 2L here at Duke Law and I'm part of Duke Law's Immigrant and Refugee Project or DERP. So DERP is a student organization here that focuses on research, resources, and outreach for the immigrant community. Um, I am happy today to be introducing our moderator and speaker for today's event, which is immigration in the 2020 presidential election, which is a timely and very important topic, as we all know. So we will be discussing today how the president shapes immigration policy separately and in conjunction with Congress, and how immigration issues have gained prominence in presidential campaigns. We will discuss the major areas of focus for both the Trump and Obama administrations, as well as the prospects for immigration reform following this upcoming election. So we'll be starting with a few remarks from our speaker, Greg Chen, and then we're gonna ask some prepared questions and then we're gonna open it up for general Q&A. So if you have any questions, um, please send them in the chat to Kate Evans. This event is co-sponsored by the Black Law Students Association, Duke's American Civil Liberties Union, Duke's International Law Society, the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University, the Latin American Law Students Association, the Middle East and North African Law Students Association, the Office of the Dean, the Office of Public Interest and Pro Bono, the Sanford School of Public Policy, and the Women's Law Students Association. Also, this event will be recorded, so please keep that in mind. Lastly, before I introduce our speakers for today, I'd like to highlight DERP's next event that's coming up. It will be Pursuing Immigration Pro Bono Opportunities While in Private Practice. That's going to be on November 10th um, at 1230 p.m. So first, I'd like to introduce Professor Kate Evans, who's our moderator for today. Kate Evans is a clinical professor of law and director of the Immigrant Rights Clinic here at Duke. She has supervised students in their representation of non-citizens facing deportation and challenging their detention before the immigration courts, the Board of Immigration Appeals, the U.S. District Courts, the U.S. Court of Appeals, and the U.S. Supreme Court. Her scholarship focuses on the use of an automated system to impose unnecessary and widespread detention by immigration and customs enforcement, as well as the common limitations in state laws that prevent local law enforcement agencies from expanding into civil immigration enforcement. So welcome, Kate. And next, I'd like to introduce Greg Chen. Welcome, Greg. Greg Chen is the Director of Government Relations for the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Prior to joining AILA in 2010, Greg worked for the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service and the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants. He came to Washington, D.C. after spending five years in San Francisco at Legal Services for Children, representing children in immigration matters, as well as child welfare, juvenile delinquency, and education law proceedings. He he is a graduate of Harvard College and NYU Law School. He clerked for the Ninth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. Greg has testified before the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives and is regularly quoted in major print media or on national news broadcasts. So welcome, Greg. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kate. Thank you so much, Mary Chandler. I really appreciate it. Um, we are thrilled to have you here today, Greg. Um, Ayla has been basically the the guiding light to get through the last four years as a practitioner, um, and I count on uh, the, the up-to-date both advocacy and sort of explanations of the ever-changing world um, that we are operating in right now. Um, as we look down the final two weeks of this presidential campaign to, to the um, elections, on November 3rd, um, we're really excited to have you to talk about, you know, the dynamics that we're seeing uh, surrounding immigration policy and immigration rhetoric, um, both in 2016 and then in 2020, um, those both looking a little bit different. And so we're um, very grateful for, for your insights on this. So first, I want to hand it over to you for your, your remarks. And then we have a number of questions that students have submitted in anticipation of, of your appearance here today. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, to you, Kate, and to the clinic and to the law students groups uh, that have invited me uh, to discuss this important issue of the future of immigration policy. Uh, the American Immigration Lawyers Association is the National Association of Immigration Lawyers, and we comprise about 15,000 attorneys and law professors across the country. Uh, core to our mission is the advancement of fair and reasonable immigration law and policy. Uh, you can get many of our resources that I'll be talking about today on our website. And for law students, you can get full access to everything AILA has to offer by joining AILA as a law student member. Our website is aila.org forward slash join if you want to be a law student member. Uh, today, I will address briefly three major topics. First, an overview of the Trump administration, what it's done on immigration. 
uh, and an analysis of how he's accomplished that agenda so effectively. Third, uh, I'll be giving some recommendations on how a future Biden administration should correct many of these harms and set a new or reestablish a new more welcoming vision for America. So the past four years of the Trump administration have brought truly unprecedented changes in immigration policy and law. Indeed, the sweep of these changes have been radical and breathtaking. Never before in its history has the United States had a president who's so determined almost single-mindedly to implement a restrictionist and anti-immigrant agenda. And practically speaking, he's done this in three ways. Uh, first, through his message. Uh, second, through a full-scale ramp up of machinery of enforcement. And third, through really a radical transformation of the legal immigration systems themselves. Now, as to message, it's really through the power of his bully pulpit, or more accurately, his Twitter account, uh, that the president has conveyed a powerfully hostile and xenophobic message. Uh, he's called Mexicans rapists. He's called Haitian and African nations an expletive. Uh, he's openly declared uh, his intent uh, to implement a total ban on Muslims, uh, which he then fulfilled. And in so doing, he betrayed an undeniable nationalistic and racist animus. And that message has permeated throughout the administration's overall policies. His most headline grabbing acts have been in the realm of enforcement. And I won't go through all of them, but they include several different kinds of bans, including most recently the CDC issued ban related to COVID. Um, he's built border walls and conducted high profile raids and increased detention use in truly inhumane ways that would just leave people in tears and do every day for those who are uh, trapped in detention or working with them. He, unlike other past presidents, has targeted enforcement to be across the board. And so rather than focusing enforcement on certain priorities, uh, he has detained and deported families, separated children from the parents, and even targeted people for deportation who might have compelling equities in a way that in the past just was not done. Now, what has gotten less attention is how the president has slowed legal immigration itself to the United States. U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services and the Immigration Courts are two critical agencies that are often overlooked, but combined, they decide well over 5 million immigration cases every day. Uh, in the courts, uh, the harmful and counterproductive management uh, that his administration has put in place has slowed down the processes so that the courts are now backlogged by more than double the number of cases they were when he came into office. And now that backlog stands at 1.2 million cases, meaning that people who apply for asylum or other forms of relief are often waiting three, four, or even more years for the case to be heard. At USCIS, processing times have also doubled, meaning children, spouses, workers, and others that might have waited six months at one point are now waiting perhaps over a year or more for green cards and other applications. Now, how has he changed immigration so radically in just four years. The vast authority of the executive branch, uh, th that the executive branch exercises over immigration is really the key piece to this. And it's a massive federal system with both enforcement and adjudicatory responsibilities. Merely by shifting the operations of these agencies or making them inoperable, the president exerts enormous power. So he's certainly lived up to his name as enforcer in chief. And he is more able to do, exert that power now due to the large unauthorized population, which is estimated at about 11 million in the United States. Um, and with so many people living in a tenuous legal status, the executive branch has even greater discretion in whether and how to enforce the law against them. If Congress acted, let's say, to pass the DREAM Act, which it was unable to do, uh, there might be a clear status for DREAMers. But instead, President Obama, after many years of waiting for Congress to act, implemented the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival program. But the new president, or not so new, President Trump has rescinded it, and he now has the authority to rescind, to completely terminate the program. And all those people, about 700,000 people, would be at risk. He's not only the enforcer in chief, but he's also a disruptor in chief. And in this regard, he stands apart from his predecessors and is willing to disrupt systems 
and literally disable federal agencies that he's charged with running. I'll just give a couple of quick examples. One is that he has now required USCIS adjudication officers in the course of reviewing somebody's case file to duplicate work and to conduct interviews with applicants when it's not even necessary. This is just like sand being thrown into the gears of a machine and it slows it down or it makes it not work well at all. On the court side, the disruption has meant uh, having judges be subject to strict rules about when they complete their cases. These are actually quotas that are part of their performance reviews. Uh, and it is designed to speed them up. But at the same time, he's stripped judges of the authority to grant continuances or to terminate cases or administratively close cases. All these have meant that the courts can't manage their cases nearly as well. And while Americans expect the judicial system to be impartial, Trump has really changed that. A powerful indication of this is the court's average asylum grant rate, which has dropped 40% on average compared to previous administrations as both Bush and Obama together. Those are just a few sketches, but I will turn now to if, President, if Vice President Biden is elected, how should he undo these significant harms that go so deeply and so broadly? And how should he reestablish America as a nation that welcomes immigrants? Well, strategically, he's gonna to need to correct the extensive damage done by the Trump administration uh, which is now a walloping 900 immigration related policies and actions. Uh, but in addition, he has to go beyond that. And he's going to need to make major improvements to the immigration system so that it actually serves our country's goals and values. He's going to need to lead with a forceful message that communicates his vision. Uh, one thing that's good is that his campaign platform already states that he sees America as integral to our country uh, and our country's values. Bold, expeditious actions absolutely vital here. Uh, he's going to have to uh, rescind memos and orders and change policies from day one. And he's going to need to set the tone very quickly uh, because especially for people who are um, in the border regions where human life is at peril, we literally have hundreds of thousands of people that are uh, let, whose lives are at risk or who are in detention. And that needs to be addressed very rapidly. Ultimately, real lasting reform is going to require Congress to act. Um, Biden has pledged to send a proposal to Congress as a priority. That being said, I am not particularly hopeful that reform can be achieved in the next term. I've spent the last 15 years fighting for reform legislation, uh, and Congress unfortunately has become increasingly partisan. The past four years has further poisoned the immigration well uh, that it will take much longer to clean the toxicity out of Washington, D.C. The only scenario that I could see where immigration would move rapidly through Congress is if Democrats win not only the White House, but both chambers of Congress. And if that happens, immigration reform should be a top priority to accomplish in the first year. So it goes without saying that if Biden is elected, he will have a huge task to accomplish. And given the increasingly decisive and critical role that the executive branch plays on immigration, um, I have, as I've argued just here, his transition team should be ready on day one with a set of policies and plans to not only ameliorate past harms, but to put our nation back on a path uh, for a powerful 21st century vision of immigration that treats all who come to our nation's borders with professionalism, respect, and fairness that is truly consistent with American values. So I'll stop there and happy to turn it back over to Kate for any questions you have, and thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, well, and that that um, I think highlighted or you know set up all of the questions that we've gotten from students thus far too. Um, and I think one thing that that you started off with, and it, it probably merits some additional discussion for law students, um, for a law student audience in particular, is really explaining um, that the difference between Congress's power over immigration laws and what hasn't has you know what has happened and what hasn't happened with respect to congressional action versus just the as you as you mentioned the relentless executive action um, that that we've seen in many different forms whether that's been decision making or rule making or these you know executive orders or proclamations and so why is it that we feel like we're seeing that so much change is happening 
from the executive branch while we're not seeing action from, from the congressional branch? How do these two sort of areas divide up the, the space and the power? Uh, so that's a, a really wonderful question, uh, particularly timely in the era that we're in now. Uh, so I would point to a, a few factors. One is uh, the executive branch uh, has filled a void, uh, especially under this administration that has been so headstrong about implementing certain, uh, a certain agenda. Uh, but the fact that Congress has not acted and done a reform of immigration policy uh, for essentially 30 years uh, has meant that uh, Congress, which sets the number of family-based visas, uh, employment-based visas, has not done that since uh, 1990. And that means that uh, literally those numbers were set at a time when Google and the internet and Amazon didn't even exist. Uh, and those numbers don't match what the needs of our economy are or American society. So the oversubscribed numbers of those visas in all categories uh, has meant that there's a much larger undocumented population that is actually coming to this country uh, because they see the demand for uh, immigrants to serve our, the economy. Uh, and a colleague of mine often gives the metaphor of, it's like having a stop sign at the border, but literally have a welcome uh, jobs uh, need to be filled sign that everybody else in the United States is signaling to people that are not in our country. And so that's led to a huge undocumented population. And what I was emphasizing before is this discretionary power over enforcement that the president now has always exercised, but with so many people whose lives stand and hang in the balance and the absence of congressional action to restructure our system to meet our country's needs, it has just meant that there is much more realm for uh, the federal executive branch to step in and implement its agenda at its discretion. Yeah, and I, I think that, um... That raises the, the sort of comparison between the Obama administration and the use of discretion there, which was, you know, a, a core feature in immigration policy under the Obama administration versus the use of discretion under the Trump administration and, and how you think about sort of the two sides of this of this coin, you know, when when so much discretionary power lies with the, the executive branch right now with the president. Uh, so that's a, an excellent uh, topic uh, that people have written books about. Uh, the, the fact is that law enforcement, by definition, not just in immigration, has traditionally operated under a system called prosecutorial discretion. Many of you may have heard this term. It's the basic recognition that uh, police on the streets, U.S. attorneys, and immigration officers cannot possibly pursue everybody at the same time and need to make smart choices about what's the best way to protect uh, people on the streets, particular our communities, or to enforce laws. And they always have to make choices about that. Under President Obama, uh, there was a clear attempt to implement what was often referred to as smart priorities or targeted priorities to identify individuals who uh, were perhaps the most flagrant violators of the law or who actually presented real threats to the United States, uh, national security or public safety, and to uh, focus on those individuals for enforcement. Uh, President Trump has really turned that around completely. And what he announced uh, very early on in his administration was that enforcement would be across the board. Uh, and so this concept of maximal enforcement at all times against everybody uh, is actually not effective because it means that actually US attorneys are pursuing cases involving people who have entered the country without authorization, and that can be prosecuted as a federal offense under federal law, but he has escalated those so much in such an aggressive way that it actually has overshadowed prosecutions for, let's say, narcotics, uh, weapon smuggling, human trafficking, which I think most Americans would think are much higher priorities. So that's where discretion has been turned on its head, and it's not effective as an overall law enforcement goal. Well, and so, you know, one of the things that I, I um, often remind students is that President Obama you know, did deport the most people of any sitting president and, and you know, comparisons with even every, uh, every year of the Trump administration, um, the, the deportations under the Obama administration exceeded those. How do you sort of reconcile that disparity in, in actual sort of numbers 
with the use of, of discretion and, and this kind of enforcement across the board um, policy by President Trump? Uh, so yeah, th there's no question about the statistics there that you cited. I mean, clearly President Obama had a very large number of people that were uh, formally removed from the country. Uh, the fact is that that's just one measure of the activities of an administration on immigration and on immigration enforcement specifically. Uh, one issue that's important to recognize is what the uh, current president, President Trump, has done to keep people from coming to the United States uh, before they even cross into our, our territory um, or when they arrive to push them back rapidly. Uh, so if you are an asylum seeker arriving at any of our southern ports of entry, you can't just come up to uh, the port of entry and get an uh, interview with an asylum officer and be processed quickly. Uh, in the early years of the Trump administration, what they did was they had uh, escalated the policy of having somebody be turned back and essentially if the term was metering, but it's like take a ticket and come back several weeks later. Meanwhile, you are living in Mexico where the conditions are, are frightening and highly dangerous uh, for anybody who's vulnerable or an asylum seeker. Uh, and so you've never made it into the United States and your arrival will never be recorded. So you've never been removed from the United States period. Uh, this is actually a strategy that has been increasingly used, not just by President Trump, but by predecessors as well, to essentially push U.S. Control, immigration control policy beyond our borders. Uh, President Trump has done this to great effect to put pressure on Mexico and Central American nations that if you want aid, if you want trade and cooperation with the U.S., you need to stop people from coming to our borders um, in your own countries. And so Mexico helps push back Central Americans. That's part of their policy now in a more aggressive way. And they experience a lot of pressure to do that uh, in economic terms. So that's just one example of where we don't see uh, in numbers of deportations what is happening. Uh, one other mm -hmm. thing that I'll just flag very quickly uh, in terms of scope of enforcement is the use of detention. Uh, Professor Evans mentioned a moment ago that that's much of what her uh, own work in the clinic focuses on. Uh, well, detention has not only increased uh, dramatically over the past 20 years, uh, but it's escalated greatly under the Trump administration. And uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of this, use of uh, family detention, uh, the separation of families have all hit the headlines. Uh, and during COVID, uh, we are seeing that detention facilities are literally a petri dish for incredibly unsanitary, dangerous conditions uh, where people are dying in, in large numbers now and contracting the disease in large numbers. Uh, across the board, in many cities, uh, there have been policies to uh, release populations from local jails and prisons that don't need to be held in detention. Uh, we've seen that under DHS and ICE, they're very slow to do that. So the lack of enlightened reform concepts in immigration, which is far uh, leaning in the other direction, uh, means that it's jeopardizing not only the people in detention, but facility personnel and also local communities. Because if you have an outbreak that results because a hospital can't treat people in a local facility, you're going to see the people in that community affected as well. So that's another way that enforcement has dramatically increased under this administration. Yeah, I we are we are um, working on a habeas petition for a client in the Northwest Detention Center that we're. I mean, it's. It is incredibly frustrating to watch these situations play out and the difficulty in prevailing on that notion of um, this individual shouldn't be facing a, a potential death sentence um, simply because he has, uh, you know, he's waiting for a decision in his immigration case. Um, and I am grateful to all the work that Ayla and many other national organizations are doing to continue to, to, to push and litigate um, these situations that were bad before COVID hit and, and far worse since. Um, one thing I wanted to go back to, you know, with respect to um, the lack of reform coming out of Congress that would shrink the discretionary space, you know, and the, and the way that that gets used by various administrations. One of the things that I'm always impressed by um, when I sort of dig in in preparation for some uh, presentation or conversation is the, the widespread support and consensus around some core principles for immigration reform. And we're not, we don't see that actually happening in Congress, but I was wondering if you could speak to, to where we do have common ground, um, you know, broadly in this country. 
Uh, sure. So, I mean, this is a, what you just said there a moment ago is probably one of the things I have said so many times over the past 10 years, which is that uh, there's widespread agreement in, uh, among policymakers and among the American public about the need to do immigration reform, uh, particularly on things such as the status of the estimated 11 million who are unauthorized within the United States. I think it's uh, recent polling uh, has consistently held that three out of four, if not more Americans uh, believe that uh, those who are in unauthorized status should have the opportunity to uh, uh, get legal status uh, as permanent, and if they would like the opportunity to become US citizens in the future. I think there's also very widespread agreement about the need to make sure there are enough uh, visas and green cards uh, to fill uh, jobs to, so that families aren't waiting months and years to reunify. Uh, so actually on a lot of the core principles of immigration reform, uh, there's widespread agreement. I think on enforcement, there is uh, perhaps less agreement between the two parties. And I think in the past four years, perhaps less agreement among the populace about what is nece necessary because uh, we've got become more of a country divided. Uh, and since this president talks so much about the need for border walls and rapid uh, aggressive enforcement, I think there may be more people in the country that think that aggressive enforcement is necessary. Uh, but I think how that gets done when you get policymakers together, uh, they actually are in pretty clear agreement. Like, I don't think there are many immigration experts at all, including those within CBP, who would support the idea of spending hundreds of millions, billions of dollars on the border wall. That's just not effective. And the president has nonetheless pers uh, pursued that goal. Uh, so the challenge here that we really face uh, to get to the political issue is uh, that we have a Congress that is more divided and a president that has exerted incredible influence over his particular party, uh, that members of the Republican Party are not willing to step outside and support reforms, even if they think it makes sense and even if they think their own constituency would generally support it. But they are afraid that if the president attacks them for being soft on immigration, uh, they will lose their office. Uh, and so we've seen inaction uh, by the Republican Party on immigration for certainly the past four years in any constructive manner. Uh, if President Trump is not reelected, uh, we could very well see uh, that partisanship increase, uh, bipartisanship increase, and Republicans more willing to come to the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that sort of that probably provides a good segue to um, a transition to, to some of the rhetoric and the use, like what the questions that are coming from. Uh, students about why has immigration become such a uh, hot and button issue in elections and, and sort of an effective political tool, um, not for sort of shared reform aims that would maybe uh, reflect the, the sentiments of, of the electorate, but, but instead um, used in, in campaigning. Yeah. So unfortunately, uh, this trend uh, you know, began before President Trump came into office. I think it's something that we've seen now, uh, certainly in the past two decades, uh, increasingly. Uh, but historically, uh, immigration and immigrants have been an easy population to scapegoat when it comes to politics. And what we're really talking about here is not a policy issue, but a political issue. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's become increasingly clear uh, that targeting of immigrants and looking tough on enforcement is something that for Republicans is an advantage, and for Democrats is a weakness to appear weak on immigration. Uh, so it, it's really for campaign uh, goals and purposes that we see that happening more and more. And I'll just give you a, a very clear cut example. In 2013, uh, that was the last time Congress really took up the effort to pass uh, a more substantial structural reform to immigration. Uh, the Senate passed um, a bill that encompassed all elements uh, Ayla supported it, even though at the end it included a horrendous uh, amount of money for enforcement, uh, but it corrected many of the ills in the current system uh, that would have been highly beneficial. That passed by 68 votes in the Senate. That's a, a substantial, powerful majority, a bipartisan majority. The House, under the control at that time by, of John Boehner, subsequently under the control of Paul Ryan, never took up any bill uh, in this, in, during that Congress or in subsequent years. Uh, and largely it was because of that, uh, the fear that Republicans would be targeted and they would lose control of the House if they supported immigration reform. 
Marco Rubio, who ran for president, Senate, Senator of Florida, who ran for president uh, and against President Trump in, during the primaries, backed away from the reform bill that he championed. He was one of the key, what was referred to as the gang of eight, four Republicans and four Democrats uh, that we worked together with to enact uh, in, the in the Senate that Senate bill. He backed away from his proposal and really wouldn't even endorse it on the campaign trail. And he was attacked for it by Ted Cruz and others. Another example of how immigration reform is a vulnerability for Republicans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you do you think or do you have data on on whether the rhetoric and immigration policy actually affects voting behavior? You think that we not all vote on, on immigration? Yeah, I am not an expert on the specific polling data patterns um, on that. I, I will say, uh, so this is not hard data in terms of statistics, uh, but I think it is widely accepted that President Trump has effectively used uh, the anti-immigrant rhetoric uh, to rile up his base. Uh, and so we hear this all the time in the current election campaign discussions uh, that he speaks to his base. So I think this message works well for them. I think the challenge is, how and whether it even appeals to the moderate, more centrist and independent population of voters right now, I would argue that it probably does not. Um, maybe even more forcefully, I think it really does not. And in, if anything, it may likely alienate voting populations that would be more supportive or inclined to agree with his economic policies mm -hmm. and other uh, policies. Uh, President uh, Bush uh, Jr. Uh, is a good example of that. Before 9-11 struck, he was on the verge of passing an immigration bill uh, with, at that time, President Vicente Fox of Mexico, which would have been a tremendous bill. That was literally on the docket to be uh, debated by the Senate uh, during uh, the weeks just before 9-11 struck. Mm -hmm. And at that point, immigration was poisoned because of the terrorism attachment and concerns. Uh, but since then, we really have had a much harder time uh, for Republicans to draw upon immigration reform as a positive campaign opportunity for them to appeal to the Latino vote and appeal to a more broad centrist voter population. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the, the branch of government we haven't yet talked about are the courts. And so how, I mean, we, we see that the Trump administration, or I'm sorry, that the Supreme Court is kicking up a number of really prominent Trump administration policies um, you know, soon, including the census and who gets counted. Um, how do you see sort of the role of the presidential election, you know, with respect to some of these core and potentially long um, uh, sweeping decisions, you know, with, with um, the, the potential to have, you know, an effect for a long time? So with specific regard to the Supreme Court, uh, maybe I'll just make two comments. Uh, one is, first of all, I, I think if uh, Judge uh, Coney Barrett is uh, confirmed and there's a 6-3 substantial conservative majority uh, on the court, I think we will see that many of the more difficult uh, policies that the Trump administration has implemented uh, will be upheld. Uh, and I think also on some of the policies where uh, perhaps a more liberal bench would have been uh, more concerned about protecting uh, the equities uh, and the issues of fairness, the constitutional issues, this uh, a more conservative court may be less inclined to do that. Uh, but the other point that I would make is that many of the more conservative positions that have come out of the court on upholding the president's authority has to do with executive discretion and executive authority. So if we have a new president come in uh, who undoes a lot of what the previous administration did, I think it will be hard to, uh, for those actions to be challenged. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe the one area that I'll just note here is uh, the DACA program, of which the President uh, Trump rescinded and then was challenged and successfully challenged until this summer uh, for him not going through the proper administrative procedures to rescind uh, the previous President Obama's policy. Now the court said, okay, you, you can go ahead and do this. And the President actually hasn't officially rescinded DACA yet. I think that's for political reasons. Uh, but that breadth of discretion that a future President Obama would also have uh, could likely receive the deference from uh, a future Supreme Court with Judge Coney Barrett on it. 
Uh, but, uh, but, and, and so that's just something that is for the tea leaves to be read, but I think it's an important factor to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think, you know, I'm, we got news this morning of, uh, of yet another restriction on asylum, um, through, uh, through a new rule that would, would limit, um, who can receive asylum as a matter of discretion. Um, and I feel like every week it's, I mean, not every week, it's every day, some major change is coming in, um, in that way. And there certainly has the feel like this is accelerating in the lead up to the, the election here um, in a couple of weeks. Um, do, you, do you think that, that there is an intentional sort of acceleration of changes or are we simply seeing all this stuff that's been percolating and it happens to be arriving in October? Uh, there's no question. There has been an intensified acceleration. Uh, that's not unusual, however. Uh, every uh, president toward the end of a term, uh, when elections are coming up, will try to uh, you know, ram through as many possible changes, uh, certainly by regulation if possible, uh, or by memos uh, if that's not possible during the uh, preceding months. And so we have seen uh, typically three or four new regulations be proposed in the past uh, two months across the board on immigration, not just asylum, but those that affect employment processing, uh, em uh, employment authorization documents themselves, uh, across the board, really. Uh, I will say that this president has accelerated to such an intensity uh, that I think many of these uh, policies or regulations will be able to be challenged mm -hmm. uh, and can probably be undone. It's the regulatory sphere uh, where they are then in code that makes it much more difficult. Uh, and uh, for that reason, we are seeing more regulations now come into place. Mm -hmm. Under President Obama, uh, the uh, NSEERS program, which most of you are probably not familiar with, was the National Security Entry Exit Registration System, uh, which came into place right after 9-11. That long acronym was basically describing a program that would subject people who are here from about 40 different countries, primarily of Muslim or Arab nationality, uh, to heightened uh, screenings and intensified uh, kind of processing. They had to go in for interviews, even though they'd already been cleared and were living here in the United States. And many of them were subject to lengthy detentions. Some were deported summarily. Uh, that had been halted under the Obama years but never removed from the books. And actually one of the last things that we fought for that President Obama then did was to uh, deregulate, uh, remove that from the reg regulatory books in December of 2016. Uh, of course, President Trump followed up almost immediately with effectively the travel ban, the Muslim ban, uh, that was far worse in its scope. Uh, but we were glad that that was removed from the regulatory system so that you wouldn't have that in place. Mm -hmm. So do you have, I, I, I have sort of two directions I'm thinking about at this point. One is I want to make sure we talk about some of the restrictions associated with different areas of immigration, which you touched on in your remarks, but um, really um, exploring how, how, you know, how far the administration has changed refugee resettlement, for example, and some of the employment um, flows um, in immigration right now. Um, and the other, uh, the other, the other road I want to go down um, is is your sort of priorities for how to actually undo what we're seeing as sort of the tsunami of changes towards the end of um, the the first, you know, the the first four years anyway. Um, and and so maybe let's start first with like how do how does the a, a Biden administration should should he win? undo this and what's the what's the priority list um, to you know for where to start uh, happy to answer that um, but since you mentioned the word u.s refugee resettlement program i can't help but just make a comment on that uh, when i first came to washington i worked for two different agencies or organizations uh, that help resettle refugees here to the united states um, at that time and for many years uh, it has been the goal set by the president in consultation with Congress uh, to resettle about 80 to 100,000 refugees worldwide every year. Uh, and that's all, not always met, but in some years uh, it has far exceeded that. Uh, when we had a large, you know, the, the crisis in China, uh, Vietnam War, Cambodian Civil War, those produced such outflows that we had 150, 200,000 people being resettled to the United States. Uh, and 
for the United States to absorb 100,000 refugees is a very small population. The refugee resettlement program is actually more of a demonstration by the United States that we are committed to humanitarian aid. It's not actually a massive humanitarian uh, program in direct assistance, because if you look at the number of Syrians, for example, who have fled from Syria, it's in the millions. The countries that have borne that, by and large, are Turkey, Jordan, uh, and some European countries like Germany that have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Syrians. Our numbers are far smaller uh, in orders of magnitude. So the US program is really just one that is meant to uh, show that we are trying to do our fair share, albeit a small proportion, given our wealth and our size as a country. Um, but under President Trump, to say the least, it has dropped to a mere fraction of that. I think this year we are on uh, track to probably settle uh, 10,000 or less. Uh, it's been hovering around that number, uh, was last year. And each year, uh, he has essentially refused to meet with Congress this year. Uh, in past years, he has not been cooperative in this process. Uh, and it means that our international relationships and our role in the United States in supporting uh, humanitarian protection, uh, which has to be a globally shared responsibility, uh, it has greatly dropped. And we are an important voice in that. We're not the only voice, but we are a very important piece of that puzzle. We fund about one third of the UN refugee agency's budget every year. And for us to back away from that is a, is a huge strike. So going back to uh, the And the thank you, I didn't want to lose that, but then I also yeah. wanted to make sure we had a, a road, a, a path um, forward for, for undoing um, at least what is coming into my inbox in relentless ways. Yeah, so uh, I can just give a sketch here. I, I started mentioning some of the steps. I mean, first of all, uh, a future President Biden will really need to do what I call re resetting the restart button on, on our system. Uh, and that means rescinding and uh, attempting to rescind uh, hundreds of actions, about 900 total actions. Some of those are proclamations and executive orders. Some of those are more minor policies, uh, but he will really need to undo many of those. And some of that can be done literally on day one. Uh, the Muslim ban, the travel ban, uh, the COVID uh, uh, ban, the asylum ban, many of those can be done almost immediately, uh, but that's not gonna be enough. Uh, and it will take much, much longer to actually get our systems to function properly. We're talking about huge uh, 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 entities, uh, agencies. It's not just Department of Homeland Security, uh, but Department of State, Department of Labor, uh, Department of Justice that all need to get functioning again. Uh, and we need to get good personnel in place. That's probably gonna be his first order to get good leadership that shares his vision. Uh, and then it's really going to be setting the machinery and the clocks functioning again. Um, since I talked a lot about enforcement, I'll actually focus more on the courts and USCIS. Mm -hmm. uh, so the fact is that USCIS is just not operating efficiently. Uh, despite having a surplus in its budget, because it's mostly, uh, its budget is dependent on fees. Uh, in 2019, it had a surplus. Uh, it had to go back to Congress and beg for emergency bailout because it was misspending and misallocating its resources. Uh, and uh, that means that visa numbers have decreased in their processing uh, in, in outright numbers. Uh, and the wait times are much longer for families and foreign workers to be able to get, fill jobs. Uh, this year, I think is the first year that I've ever seen where uh, the USCIS will not actually even fill, has not filled all the family visa slot, slots that are available. Uh, so about 100,000 or more of those visas will actually be shifted over for employment-based purposes uh, the statute allows for that. If one is undersubscribed or, or not able to be utilized, uh, the other system, meaning family versus employment, can utilize them. Uh, it's not that family visas are undersubscribed, it's just that the agency failed to process those properly and block people through all the various bans and restrictions from being, being able to take advantage of them. Uh, that's a real tragedy and failure of the system to do what Congress has mandated the agency to do, which is Congress sets the number of visas. Executive branch, you are to implement that. You are to review those and adjudicate them and grant them. And it's not because there aren't enough to be reviewed or that they're all uh, ineligible. It's that the agency just didn't do its job right. And, and that's, that's, that's a terrible shame. On the court side, just to mention quickly, mm -hmm. uh, th the fact is we depend and think of the courts as neutral arbiters, as impartial adjudicators of cases. 
uh, but this administration has put uh, a huge amount of power shifted into the hands of the bureaucratic administrators that are in charge of the courts uh, to, first of all, uh, undo uh, decisions of the uh, appellate uh, and the trial bench of the courts, uh, which is just unheard of. Uh, they've appointed many more people who have ideological or prosecutorial bias, uh, which just undermines the faith and integrity in our court system to begin with. A lot of that is due to the fact that the immigration courts are housed, not independently, but as part of the Department of Justice within the executive branch. The Department of Justice is the lead prosecutor, the chief prosecutor ultimately for immigration cases. So there's a conflict of interest there. And that prosecutorial bias has infected the courts. Uh, and there's pressure to streamline and deport more people more quickly that the courts can't avoid. And that's one of the reasons AILA, the American Bar Association, uh, the Federal Bar Association, and the National Association of Immigration Judges themselves all support legislation that would create an independent court system outside of the Department of Justice. Uh, and it's a structural reform that will take time to implement, uh, but is a critical reform. And those are among the, the legal immigration side institutions that really need to be looked at carefully. Yeah, I, I mean, gosh, I would love that. It's, it's always um, fascinating to try to explain to students sort of the, the appellate process and the adjudications within the executive branch and then moving to um, the, the judicial courts of appeals and who opposing counsel is and who the adjudicator is. And they're always like, wait, what? Um, because yeah, all of a sudden you're like, okay, well, their client is now the person that just decided against you. And you know, that the, the um, the shifts there, but but the lack of independence is just so apparent through throughout that process. Um, one of the questions we we got in um, as you were speaking uh, from a student is that a lot of the conversation has been been based on a, a potential Biden presidency, um, and he wanted to hear more about if Trump is reelected, how can we limit? The, the further damage potentially to immigration, to his approach to immigration, um, you know, and potentially sort of relatedly, how effective are comments, you know, in this rulemaking process, you know, and, and in that sort of formal um, process of, of the executive branch's um, reforms right now? Uh, so I, I'd like to try to give more of a ray of sunshine or hope uh, in response to that question, but I think it will be extremely difficult. Uh, I think if President Trump is elected to a second term, uh, first of all, the systems and machinery of executive branch uh, policy making on immigration are all in place now. We saw in 2017 when he was first elected that the administration really didn't know what it was doing very effectively. And they trotted out a bunch of uh, orders and proclamations that uh, they didn't have their shoes tied yet and they tripped on them multiple versions of the travel ban for example that came out and were successfully challenged uh, by litigators in court so litigation uh is an effective tool and will continue to be uh but as you already flagged with the supreme court uh, i think it's going to be much harder uh if especially if uh the confirmation of judge uh coney barrett goes through and they have a 6-3 majority it'll be much harder for litigators to uh, challenge uh, these restrictions. The Muslim ban was upheld under an unusual authority that hadn't been used much before, 212F of the Immigration Nationality Act, which is essentially a national security provision that gives uh, quite a bit of authority for the president to regulate who comes in. And the court said as much uh, for the third uh, iteration of the Muslim ban that was challenged. Uh, but that authority has continued to be used. It was used uh, for part of the COVID-related bans. Uh, and it'll be very hard to challenge it. And if the court gets stacked even further, uh, litigation is going to be a weaker arm, a weaker method to use. Uh, you mentioned regulations. Uh, AILA comments on most, if not all, of the major regulations that uh, come out on immigration. Uh, and uh, formally, the agency has a responsibility to respond uh, to every unique comment that is submitted uh, on a particular regulation. It's supposed to account for it, explain, provide reasoning for uh, why it's going to stick with its current comment, uh, its current regulation that's proposed, or change it based on comments. Uh, but the fact is that this administration has already shown a willingness to disregard so many of the procedures in law that uh, all past administrations had typically respected, 
Uh, and even in its proposed regulations, we frequently see lack of reference to any kind of uh, research or data to support why uh, a new regulation is being proposed. Uh, we're about to submit regulation comments on a new asylum ban. Uh, it's well, new asylum regulations that will uh, make it much harder to seek asylum um, and set, let's say, a 15-day deadline for filing for asylum, which is extremely short. They didn't give any real explanation for why that would be effective or uh, if that was even achievable. Uh, so there's no data to support it. Uh, we will explain why they need to do that and why it fails, uh, but they can disregard that. And the only check would be Congress or the courts at this point, uh, both of which are going to be much more limited moving forward. Uh, so I think we will face uh, an even steeper climb uh, as time goes on uh, if the administration is, uh, is reelected. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to find, yeah, I want to find that ray of hope too, but, um, but, but I, I understand the reality that, that we would confront there. Um, and I think probably importantly, it would be nice to, to hear you drill down a little bit. Um, we talked right before we, we formally, uh, started this conversation about the work of the justice campaign and the, the work of a lot of pro bono attorneys on the southern border um, and how that's also shifted um, amid the, the ban related to, to COVID. Um, but I think it's really important that people understand how different um, the southern border looks these days um, and, and what work can be done there. Yeah, so I'll talk first about just our immigration justice campaign and then also maybe a little more broadly about southern border issues. Uh, so AILA and our sister organization, the American Immigration Council, started a project uh, basically soon into the uh, 2017, at the beginning of President Trump's administration, uh, called the Immigration Justice Campaign. It's a pro bono uh, but also effort, uh, but also a locally based partnership uh, where we uh, have volunteers that assist in the representation of people that are primarily coming in as recent arrivals that are then detained either in the border regions or very quickly thereafter sent to interior detention facilities. Uh, these are often families uh, and uh, children that are impacted by this. And uh, for any of you who are on the call now who are either law students uh, who are practicing lawyers, uh, go to immigrationjustice.us. Uh, that's our campaign website. Um, or you can go to ala.org and there'll be a link there. Uh, and there are opportunities for you to uh, volunteer either uh, remotely or in person. The in-person capacity is different now because of COVID, uh, but in the past we had law school clinics or teams of people uh, sent by a law firm go to, uh, let's say, Dilly, Texas and uh, stay there for a week and uh, help screen asylum seekers, help prepare uh, requests that they be released from custody. Uh, because even though they're asylum seekers, they are tipped as a matter of course now, held in detention for the course of their case, uh, which didn't used to be the case, but has become the norm, the de facto practice. And it is so much harder to get a fair opportunity to seek asylum when you're in detention, if for any reason that you are desperate to do anything to get out of detention and you'll give up your case just for that reason, but also because you can't get um, any real opportunity to uh, have a lawyer represent you, which is critical in an immigration case. Uh, so, I would uh, recommend that to any of you, happy to speak with you if you want to email me later about it. Uh, with respect to just what's happening at the southern border, uh, and that, that is such a huge topic. Uh, one of the ways that the president has been so effective is to layer on multiple overlapping or redundant policies to block people from coming to the country. Uh, I mentioned how some of that is, on, uh, is beyond our borders at the southern border, uh, but then we've got multiple kinds of bans that operate uh, to make it harder for people to enter. Uh, we have uh, wait policies that require you just to wait if you see, you're seeking asylum. Uh, we also have agreements with those foreign countries that uh, they not send certain people to the United States or that certain people won't even be eligible if they pass through uh, Central America or Mexico before coming to the United States. That layering has been incredibly effective and uh, it means that, uh, I, I don't think I am exaggerating here to say the asylum system has really been eviscerated. Uh, it is incredibly, if not difficult, if not impossible to obtain asylum. Uh, and some of the first steps that we will need uh, under a Biden administration uh, would be to surge 
resources to the southern border, not the kind that President Trump has surged, uh, because we have plenty of enforcement officers there. Customs and Border Protection is at 19,000, 20,000 officers now that are stationed in that region. Uh, but what we need are asylum officers to actually screen people because Customs and Border Protection has been begun doing asylum interviews. They are simply not qualified to do that. And I would argue that it's against the statute uh, for them to be doing these kinds of interviews. It's not their skill set, and they're not oriented that way. And they will frighten people with a gun in their holster when they talk about asylum. Uh, so we need asylum officers there. We also just need simple humanitarian aid kinds of responses, meaning more medical, uh, mental health, and social service assistance for people that are stuck in these short-term border facilities uh, that are quite honestly traumatized, not just by whatever persecution they may have experienced before coming here, but by their journey and by having to wait in Mexico before they can come into the United States. So the surge of those resources will be critical to not just a fair processing, of people at our border, but also to an efficient and orderly processing of those people, which is going to be something that the Biden administration is going to be very uh, careful about. It does not want, uh, no administration wants to see chaos at the border of the kind that happened in the latter years of Obama, or that's been happening consistently under President Trump. Uh, so that orderly processing will be critical uh, to effectuate. Um, and the final thing that I'll maybe just mention here is uh, the, you know, what happens when you are coming in at the port of entry? Uh, the current practice is to put people into detention. Uh, that is extremely expensive for the American taxpayer. We're talking about over $2 billion a year to hold people who are primarily asylum seekers and families uh, who certainly pose no threat but to our communities, but also who don't need to be detained because they're likely to want to show up to court to get their asylum relief. That's the way they're getting a legal status. So they have a strong incentive. And programs that release people into the community have been demonstrated to be highly effective. Uh, and what needs to be done is to look at methods to increase uh, the use of community-based case management programs where you provide information about their legal rights and responsibilities to show up at court. You provide methods for getting them integrated into the community so that they will appear in court uh, and go through the legal process as is required of them. Uh, and these have just been found to be far more successful and effective. And so that's another step that President uh, Biden, if he's elected, should really take uh, into, into account as a high priority. Yeah, thank you. I, that's, I mean, I would love to see all of those uh, policy changes happen. And I think one of the things that's been so disturbing to see is that we as a country have essentially created refugee camps, you know, on the Mexico side of the border um, in an effort to, you know, to, as you say, move, shift the, 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 the closure of our immigration system outside the country. So it's not under such, under such a spotlight and, and so um, clearly available for, uh, for scrutiny. Um, but that as, a, as sort of a, a um, effect of that policy um, is, is just heartbreaking. Um, and, and so frustrating, you know, especially amid COVID and the ever, you know, increasing layers there to not be able to do those trips to the border, to not, you know, be able to, to respond at least, you know, um, in our own ways um, to that crisis. Um, so Zach Pollack, one of our uh, student leaders here, just put into the chat the link to the immigration justice campaign so that um, everybody here has, has that, um, that link. Um, we are at the end of our time. I wanted to just make sure that you had um, a moment for any last um, plea or closing remarks as we, um, we face down our final two weeks to the, to the presidential campaign uh, before we thank everybody and say goodbye. Sure, I'm happy to make a couple of quick remarks. One is simply that this election will be critical. Uh, I think uh, we will see uh, just dramatically different approaches on immigration from these uh, to uh, the president and candidate Biden on immigration. If uh, President, uh, uh, if Vice President Biden is elected as president, uh, I think we will have an incredible opportunity to see change be put in place. Uh, but a future Vice President, a future President Biden will be in a very difficult place to implement all these changes quickly. And that's why, as law students, uh, as members of the legal community, it's going to be so important that we work together and as stakeholders, uh, ex make sure to educate both the incoming administration as well as Congress and the public about the need for these because he's gonna respond to 
the depth of public concern, he won't be able to undo 900 uh, actions in the first year or even in the first four years. Uh, he's going to want to do it in a way that is thoughtful. Uh, but I would emphasize that we need bold action from a future President Biden uh, to act in the first weeks and months of his presidency on immigration. And that's going to take voices uh, from the American public uh, and from those who are really invested in this. Uh, and leaning into that process is going to be absolutely important. Uh, so I would leave with that note that uh, the work doesn't end uh, with the election of a new president. The work begins there. Uh, that's what AILA is very much focused on. We want to be a, a counsel to a new administration to be able to influence what they do to make sure that's done the best way and the right way. Uh, but we also want to be a cudgel, um, a voice to push a new administration to do the right thing because they will need, and I think if they are smart, they will appreciate pressure from the outside to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much for spending your time with us um, right before the election um, as we are all sorting through the information coming into our phones and our inboxes and all our mailboxes and every other um, form of outreach right now and are grateful for you to, to take some of that apart and um, lay out a plan to move forward. So thank you again for your time. Thanks to everybody for joining us today and we hope to see you back for our final event in the series on November 10th. Um, uh, about how to incorporate pro bono immigration practice into your private practice. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody.